Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third Black All Year event. Um, if you missed the first two, they are available on YouTube and as a podcast. And if you are watching or listening to this after the event, then please like and subscribe as it makes sure that you don't miss any of the future material and it helps others to find the content. So briefly, what is Black All Year? Well, it's really been created by me as a reaction to the fact that during Black History Month, I am in demand to talk about equality, diversity, inclusion, being a black female leader, um, but that for the 11, other 11 months of the year, um, it's not really something that people want to talk about. And I got a bit cross because um, we should be talking about these issues all year round because we are black all year. Um, so these events um, and some extra material that's available on the podcast and on YouTube are there to really um, look at the issues and challenges and celebrate the achievements and successes of black people. So today I'd like to welcome our two fantastic guests. Um, so first of all, we have Evelyn or Evie Mensa. She's a consultant ophthalmic surgeon at Central Mid Middlesex Hospital um, and London Northwest University Healthcare NHS Trust, where she is the clinical lead for ophthalmology. She's involved in charity work in West Africa and has developed a pioneering training for West African ophthalmologists. Evie is part of the senior cohort of the London Workforce Race Equality Standard, which is the RES programme, and that's designed to improve experiences of ethnic minority staff in the NHS. And she is also a member of the Medical Workforce Race Equality Standards London Steering Group. Um, and Evie is also a close family friend. Her parents and my parents have been friends for a very long time. So really delighted to have Evie with us. My second guest is Carol Stewart, who is the founder of Abounding Solutions and author of Quietly Visible, leading with influence and impact as an introverted woman, which was listed as one of the 10 best self-development books written by women to read during lockdown. She's an executive career and leadership coach, specializing in introverted women who are senior leaders and is a five times LinkedIn Top Voice UK, including a LinkedIn Top Voice 2022 for gender equity and has received awards for her work developing women leaders. She hosts the Quietly Visible podcast and is a semi-regular columnist for the Sheffield Telegraph as well as being a TEDx speaker. And we first came into contact with each other through the Black Northern Women Group um, when I was a speaker for one of her events. So fantastic having you both here. So today we've got a, a really meaty topic, I think it's probably safe to say. We're talking about anti-Blackness and colorism, and I think it's really important that we um, we first of all talk about well, what do those terms mean because they're not necessarily terms that people are familiar with. So let's start with anti-blackness. What what do you think that anti-blackness means? What what does it mean to you? Are you asking us? Uh, yes, I'm asking you. All right, I'm going to get my. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get I'm going to get my slides up to share. No problem. These are these are you wanted to talk about anti-black anti-blackness first and okay let's go down well, we can talk, go on, talk about anti-blackness first yeah all right then i mean well i i mean when i when i think about um anti-blackness um i know what's written on this slide but before i actually sort of like looked it up and thought what it what it was um i just felt that it was uh, racism directed towards black people people who identify as black basically that is it and I don't think that the person who's the perpetrator of that racism doesn't have to be necessarily white they can be any race so that's that's what I understand about anti-black racism and, and Carol what what about yourself yeah so that is that is my understanding it's racism a form of racism that is specifically targeted at people of African um heritage and I think because um, here in the UK, particularly, when it comes to talking about different ethnic um, groups, then having that umbrella term BAME, which is, is a term that I dislike, 
it, it doesn't help to identify the specific challenges of individual groups because each individual group has their own specific challenges. And particularly when it comes to black people, there is um, a historical legacy that um, stems from the transatlantic slave trade, which impacts on a lot of the anti-black racism that we see today. Yeah, and, and I think it, it is interesting that thing. So I remember seeing um, an interview with some member of, of the, the cabinet and there was a question asked about how many black people are there who are in the cabinet? And they said, well, we have we have many BAME people. And um, I said, yeah, but how many black people are in the cabinet? Well, we have many people from um, from BAME communities. Yes, but how many black people? And and there was there's this distinction, I think, between um, between black, as in of African descent and others that people don't quite get and they don't recognize that there is a, a difference in the way that people are perceived. So you'll get people say, oh no, I'm not racist. I've got, I've got Indian friends. Yeah, and I, I remember that interview very well because that was one of the reasons I, um, one of the things that I do as a, uh, on a voluntary basis a, is a, a group called, uh, an organization called Black Northern Women and we host an international women's day conference for black women in the north of England. Um, and in 2020, we started a petition on the um, government petition website to stop using that umbrella term, BAME, because it, it doesn't help to identify the specific in issues of individual groups. Yeah, yeah. I hate and it. Actually, yeah, it, it is. I absolutely hate it. And I'll tell oh. you why, all right? I'll tell you why I hate it. I know it's an, I know it's an acronym. It's, 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 it's Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. Um, first of all, it's not recognized internationally. So if you were going to publish a paper and you put that acronym BAME, you know, people wouldn't even understand what you're actually um, talking about. And I think it kind of makes people, you know, I, what I hate about, I, sometimes I don't even mind. I mean, sometimes you have to have a kind of term, right? Whether it is that you describe people as, you know, the global majority, some people like to say, people don't like to say ethnic minorities because it minoritizes you know, people of, or people of color, you know, sometimes you need a, a generic, sometimes you need to disaggregate people, okay, into the different racial groups, but sometimes you do need something collective. But what I, so I would, I would rather that you said black, Asian, minority, ethnic, all right, mm -hmm. that's you, or, or, or maybe BAME, but not BAME, like a one acronym word, like BAME, there are BAME people, there are people who live in BAME houses, yeah. You understand, mm. like a noun, it just doesn't, I feel like the hairs on the back of my neck just go up and I'm like, oh, like this, you know, someone's, as soon as somebody says BAME, and then what's worse is that when you tell people not to say it, and I have to say, it doesn't matter whether you're white, you're black, or you're brown, everybody says it, all right? And then they say it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and actually, I mean, I, I tend to use global majority but you have to explain what that means. Mm. And, I, and I say minoritized global majority because that's in effect what we are. We've been made a minority, even though in numbers we're the majority. But I think that going back to that initial point about anti-Black, there are, so within that BAME um, umbrella, you have, you have um, people who are from East Asia, so kind of Chinese, Japanese, that type of, um, of, of ethnicity. You have Southeast Asians, you have Black people, you have Arabic people. You, so you have a whole host of different people that are put under. You have Roma people who actually skin tone are, are very, very fair. Um, so you have all of that put under that, that one umbrella. And we are very, very different, but the way in which we are treated is very, very different. And um, it does unfortunately seem to be the darker your skin, the worse the treatment that you get. 100%. Uh, yeah. So let's let's go on to colorism then. So what do we mean by colorism? Because I've got to admit, this was a, a relatively new term for me. Right, so as I'm trying to go up my slides, because there you you're, go. you're presenting, you're making me present this in, in the wrong, oh, there we go. It's all right, we've got it. <laughs> Yeah, so colorism um, is is basically a, dis is a discriminatory it's discrimination that's actually based on the basis of your skin tone. Um, 
some people would describe it as skin shade pre prejudice, where the privilege is towards those with lighter skin tones. And it's often among same ethnic or racial groups. And it's actually different from racism, but it is related. So you can describe racism as being interracial between us, yeah. Colorism is intra, it can be within. Um, it's actually a product of colonization, colonialism, and it's global. It's, I mean, it's, it's not just here in the UK and Europe, it's in Africa, Asia, North America, everywhere. And the people who talk about it extensively and publish on it extensively in the USA is uh, Professor Ronald E. Hall. Um, and he's got a rather large publication coming out in July this year. And he's got over 200 papers of where he's been publishing on colorism in America. And he's traveled to more than 25 different countries. And here in the UK, um, we have Dr. Aisha Phoenix. She's a lecturer in social justice at KCL. Um, and she's looked at colorism and she talks about it being gender because she says that she feels it's more against, the people who come out worse are black, are black women. Mm. Yeah. And in fact, I could add to that, yes, it, it is a, um, a legacy of colonialism and also the transatlantic slave trade as well. And historically, with, when, when, with regards to the transatlantic slave trade, those who were enslaved, who were lighter skin, um, and these were the children that were born as a result of um, enslaved women being often being raped. And they were treated more favorably because of their lighter complexion. And they would carry out the domestic tasks while those with the darker skin worked in the fields. Um, and it's, as, as um, Evelyn has touched on, it's not just, um, it concurs within the same racial group as well. Um, and historically, darker skinned people have experienced prejudice from within their own community, but not just darker skinned people, often we see that those who are fairer skin can be treated less favorably by the darker skinned people because of the historical context. Mm -hmm. um, and we still see it occurring today. I remember the first time I visited Jamaica and that's where my parents came from. That, I think that was the first time that it really stood out for me. When I went into things like the banks, it was just so blatant. You saw all the fairer skinned people who were serving on the, at the customer desk, whereas the darker skinned people were in the back office. Um, and there's been some research that has been carried out with regards to the um, impact that it has. Um, and according to the World Economic Forum, Studies have shown that there is an existence of a wage gap linked to skin colour, which widens as the shade of the work um, the person darkens. And there was a 2006 study that showed that fair-skinned applicants receive better ratings than uh, darker-skinned applicants in employment-related decisions. And a, there was a 2018 study that found that lighter-skinned young Black adults attained a higher education level received high wages and enjoy better quality jobs than those who are darker skinned. Um, a lot of this work of uh, research around colorism tends to be based in the US, but I would, I would say that a lot of what we see happening there applies here in the UK as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think it, being somebody who's light skinned black myself, I think it's, it for me, I probably really became, first became aware of colorism a few years ago, and the, the term colorism. And I, I've probably experienced both elements of it, as you've said, Carol. So there's been that, um, that element of being told I wasn't black enough. And I, I, can't, I can't recall if I've told this in an, at an earlier event, but um, I was actually on a training scheme for black leaders and was one of the um, black people who was um, who was part of um, the, the training scheme that I've been working alongside for a, a while, actually said to me, 
um, at our graduation when I was dancing. Oh, I see you actually are black. Now I can see you dance. And it was like, whoa, OK, that was really unexpected. Um, but equally, I know that my um, my version of being black is more palatable to a lot of people, a lot, of, particularly a lot of white people, but a lot of people. And um, it was more pal palatable to my ex-in-laws who were Asian because I was fairer skinned. Um, and actually, Ngozi, who's, who's joined us today, um, we were joking about it the other day, and she, she said, yeah, you're a bit like the Barack Obama of, of Black women. And it's kind of like, yeah, I am, because I, I speak with a Geordie accent and I'm fair-skinned and all that. So, so I know that I don't experience the extent that actually either of you two um, may have experienced the, the kind of prejudice that, that you may have, have experienced. Yeah, and so, I can see someone in the chat has commented about... Um, it breaks their heart that women will bleach their skin to look fairer and, and then therefore enjoy more benefits and that's some, to me is something which is a, a global problem um and the the skin lightening um cream industry has the sales have gone up considerably um and it was reported that global scales of skin lightening products are expected to reach 8.9 us billion by 2024 and that is up from four billion in 2017. So that is um, that's double. And you, you see it in countries so in Africa, in Asia, the Caribbean, Middle Eastern countries, where they and even here in the UK and in the US, where um, darker skinned women will use skin lightening um, products see because using, of see the use in the Philippines, even in the Philippines. And I think that I think when we're talking about colorism, we have to acknowledge the sensitivity of this subject um, because um, prejudice based on colorism does actually harm because there's colorism that may be in the industry when it, whether it may be that it's advertisement, whether it's um, in public private sectors as Carol has actually just mentioned, but also within families themselves. Um, and we have to um, acknowledge um, the, the sensitivity and the, and the harm that this can have on individuals, which can be uh, long lasting. Yeah, and, and oftentimes my, my co when I'm coaching someone, it's, um, they are experiencing the effects of what you just talked about, Evelyn. So that it, well, it can lead to a, a lack of self-belief in people because they feel that they're not good enough. Um, I had a friend who, a very dark complexion, but her, her sister was very fair skinned, very light. Um, and as a child, comments were made about her being dark, about a lot of comments were being made that she then developed this self-complex about it as she became an adult. And uh, it wasn't in done with any sort of malicious intent, but it was a lack of awareness a lack of understanding by her parents, by other elderly family members who themselves had been subject to that, that they had put on their children. Um, and we still, we still see that today where somebody who, um, particularly when it comes to things around hair, around their skin complexion, you, know, you hear the term sometimes, oh, this person has got good, like people will say about their children, oh, this child has got good hair, whereas, whereas this child hasn't. All hair is good hair. Yeah, and, and one of the future topics that I really, really want to cover is, is about hair and black hair in particular, because I think that history and, and politics around black hair is just, um, is just amazing. Um, so, um, Evie, I don't know if you want to carry on sharing or, or not, but um, so we've got, so it, to me, it almost sounds like Colorism is about that, that difference between the, the colors and, um, and, and the shades of, of brown, for want of a better term. Um, Anti-blackness almost seems like the, the worst element of that, the, the end point of that. So um, I know that you, I think you said it, even that it tends to be that that's more between races or ethnicities rather than within ethnicities. Yeah, so so anti-black racism can be can be the perpetrators of anti-black racism can be victims of racism themselves. It doesn't mm. necessarily 
you know, white people against black people. It can be any race. It can be South Asian. It could be anybody. Yeah, um, yeah. Black people at the bottom of the pile again. You, you understand? Mm -hmm. I think there was a comment in, in, in the chat about, about evidence. There's so much evidence and it's not our job to necessarily give people the evidence. If people want the evidence, they can go into Google, yeah. search it themselves, and they can actually get the, the publications about it. There's lots of publications on all of this. Yeah. And you did actually reference to, to writers. To, and to, to writers, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can that. actually share some links of the, the, the studies that I talked about. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be great if you wouldn't mind popping them in the chat. And that to, mm. I think you're absolutely right, Evelyn. I think people, people should be looking for this stuff themselves. Uh, but it is useful also to have a starting point. Um, so don't just rely on what we're sharing. Use that as a starting point and, and, and go on from there. Um, so when we have people that will... That let's, I'm going to go back to the, the cabinet. So um, I, th I think he's in the cabinet. We do have a black we're, man we're, in, we're, in the UK that cabinet. That was, was the one that was being it interviewed. Was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think we do now have one black man who I think is probably in the cabinet. He might be a junior minister. I'm not too sure. And I don't know the definition between them. But actually, people keep saying, oh, it's the most diverse cabinet we have ever had. And they point to Priti Patel and um, Sajid Javid and um, the to the man who I can't recall his name at the moment, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, Rishi Sunak. And they say, look, we're not racist. Look. Look at look at our cabinet. Look how diverse we are. That doesn't show. I mean, it never shows it. Look at my look at my black friend. I'm not racist. Never works. That's that's not evidence that you're not racist. <laughs> However, the fact that there are people of what I would call Southeast Asian heritage in the cabinet actually could be evidence of anti-blackness. The thing is, is that, is that, is that I've never, I don't think I've ever actually heard anybody in the government say, not that I necessarily want to talk about the government per se, but I don't think I've actually ever heard anybody in the government say, um, I, I am anti-racist. Okay. Mm. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I kind of switch off uh, when people say, um, anybody, it doesn't have to be a government person, when people say, I'm not racist, firstly. If you say to me, um, I, I am endeavoring to become anti-racist, then, then I prick up and think, oh, right, we're on the same page. You know, we can now start this dialogue because it's a journey, it's a journey of learning. And unless you're at that, that level, I'm not sure that I can, you understand, it's too exhausting, it's too tiring. There are, there are some people who will come on that journey with you there will some people who won't, they'll want the evidence, they'll want data, they'll want more data, they'll want even more data, and then they'll be in denial and you're living with yourself. But if you already acknowledge and accept that racism exists and it exists, in every, it exists everywhere and you want to do something about it, if you then said to me, you know what, I'm anti-racist, I want to go on this journey, you understand, then I, then I can then start having that, that dialogue with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've, ju I've just seen a comment in the, the, the um, chat that I just want to pick up on. So there's, uh, black women are beautiful, dark skinned black women are beautiful. And I'm sure this is coming from, from the right place. But um, <clears throat> I can remember seeing something quite recently where there was a, a, a model um, who is black African origin and she is very, very dark skinned. Now, she's a model. She's going to be beautiful. Let's just take it as red. The models tend to be quite attractive. Um, but very, and she is very, very dark skinned. And the person who shared this photo shared the picture of this, this black woman commenting on the colour of her skin. And I would say, in, in very complimentary ways, but actually made me feel really uncomfortable. Um, because it was, I would say, exoticizing it, if that's actually a word. It was it seems almost like fetish, like fetishizing. That's it. It yeah. was very much that, you know, oh, she looks like she looks like stone and marble and and so it, yeah. it was I, think kind of, I know the one that you're talking about. It was the he was the chair of the American Psychiatric Association. Yeah. 
-hmm. and he commented on um what was it he said something about exotic or something or other or freak of nature yes um, and you know there was uproar about it he sort of tweeted it tweeted an image of her and there was uproar about it and I don't think he really understood why which again shows the extent of the racism that exists because he he wasn't aware of it but then he took his tweet down and he was subsequently um I think he was he was either suspended or dismissed I think he had a chair and he, he'd had the chair removed from him um, mm -hmm. I don't think he actually was sacked but but to me that that was I feel actually that 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 falls under that anti-blackness because it was kind of I can't just accept that this person is black She's very dark skinned black and therefore that's a thing, that's a difference. And I've got to make it something that's acceptable and palatable rather than, cool, she's stunning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and said there's, that, there's a freak of nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, what does that say? So basically what, what that person was doing was objectifying her. Mm. Her almost slightly, almost not almost slightly, treating her as I mean, freak of nature, all right? I mean, talk about your, the language that's being used, all right? Freak of nature, making it seem as if she's an object. She's a human being. And this is the, this is the issue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. of, of this sort of de dehumanizing language uh, yeah. that used around racism. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Melissa's actually what the Melissa's actually said people will say she's beautiful for, for, for a dark skinned woman. Mm -hmm. And what no, was so she's... concerning was his position as someone who was a very senior psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, which shows really that this isn't about intelligence or education. And um, this is this is a, a cultural issue that it is acceptable to speak and think and treat people who are dark skinned differently to everybody else and people who are black differently mm -hmm. to others. As we see this, <coughs> Steph, if you think, you know, we, we already seeing, we, we, it's been around, I mean, as, you, as we all know, racism has been around for like four, more than 400 years and, um, and it's going to be, take a huge global effort <laughs> for people to get the anti-racism bandwagon but here's hope, hoping and, and 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 also look at look at children look at how our children are being treated look 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 at look at how you know what happened to child q you know look look what happened to the boy um with the boat and the barge or whatever that got hit over the head you know it doesn't matter whether you're a child whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whatever age you are, there's that racist discrimination and you're perceived, black is perceived as dangerous, as, as, as less than human, you know, un, un, unintelligent. And I don't get it personally, obviously. Yeah. I just don't get it. And uh, it's interesting that both of you referred to colonialism and you kind of go, and part of me thinks really still, but it, but you're right. It's 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 pervasive, and I think we see it in so many elements of um, Western culture that that legacy of colonialism. Um, and I, I do wonder whether there is that. So there is a. I believe there is a difference in the way that people who are of Black African descent, and people who are of um, Southeast Asian descent are viewed in terms of our abilities, of our um, work ethic, of our um, intelligence. And I do question how whether that is not connected to the transatlantic slave trade. Because that, that's sorry. Sorry, carry, no, on. carry on, carry on, Carol. No, and I and I would agree with that, and I think that you know we're still seeing the legacy of that today. Um, I mean, you look at um, you look at say stop, stop and search. Black people are stopped and searched far more than any other ethnic group, far more than Asian groups. You look at the mental health system, the number of black people that are within the um, mental health system. 
far exceeds any other group. You look at crime, any, anything which um, disadvantages people in society, black people are more overrepresented. Anything which favours people in society, black people are more underrepresented. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a. Um, it, I think if we look at, at how colonialism happened, and obviously in in a large part of Africa, what drove that was about going and taking people to populate um, <coughs> um, areas to uh, as slaves, taking people as slaves. When you look at what happened in other areas of the world, it was about going and trading slash stealing from them, but the people were treated differently. There was a diff, there wasn't that, that slavery wasn't going on. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not for a second saying that what happened in India was right or appropriate and that people were treated well because it wasn't at all, but it was a different level of treatment. Um, and I remember going going to one of the slave castles in Ghana and having a fantastic guide there who was talking about the way in which people were treated as slaves. And it was the first time somebody had said this in this way to me. They said, these were, um, these were commodities. These were valuable commodities. Each person was money in, in effect. So if you were saying, I need to sell this person, and I know I'm going to get more money if this person is fit and healthy. You would treat that person well. You'd feed them well. You'd make sure they got everything they needed so that when they got to sale point, a bit like you do with a pig, you know, you treat your pigs well, you feed them up, and then you get the best possible price. And I know it's awful talking about people like that, but that's the way that we were seen. That's not what they did, though. What they did was they dehumanized and they degraded and they raped and they tortured. That was about breaking spirit and making us not, not human in, in everybody's eyes. That happened in Africa. It didn't happen to other ethnicities. So that legacy then continues in the, we are still seen as less than. Mm -hmm. and, and the darker skinned you are, the more people see you as that. It's can I speak? Yeah, did we have somebody wanting to, to contribute there? Sorry. Yeah, is it okay to, yeah. Yeah, I, of course it is. I, I'm sorry about that. And let me do this really quickly. I've been, <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. Um, so there just seems to be such an amazing powerhouse group of women. And I see there's some men as well. Um, I, what I would love, because I think we were done in less than 30 minutes, correct? Is that? Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. Will we ever, will we get a chance to touch on possible solutions? Because I feel like there's a lot of us that, I mean, I, I'm just blessed, to, obviously American, but I live in London. Um, but I, I feel obviously having this American perspective and really lucky to have the parents that I did name me an African name, very connected to my roots in that way. Um, so we talked about this a lot. Um, so I feel like as I've searched out in the world and went to different discussions, there, there, it, there always seems to be more discussion than talk about solutions. And I would love if we can maybe start maybe talking about ways in which we can start um, even amongst ourselves as black people, right? Because the racism issue is a white issue, right? It's not a people of color issue. <laughs> I mean, we have to deal with it, but it's almost like you caused the problem. And it's like, now, now you guys solve it, but we're going to keep causing the problem. Whereas, Whereas with, with, with um, colorism, I feel like that is definitely... definitely even though it's still kind of a, obviously the root of racism, right, that has caused that, I do believe that's something that's internal amongst us. Um, so, yes. Nandi, you're right. You're absolutely right. You're 100% right in exactly what you're saying. And it's a taboo subject, Nandi. Uh, it's a it's a taboo subject so, because and it's and and you guys in um, US, you're you're way ahead of us in the UK. All right. I mean, there are some people probably on this platform who have heard the word. They don't even know what the word color. They don't even know about colorism. They've never heard about it. They don't understand it. But it's definitely something that exists amongst our community, not just us, our black community. It exists in the Asian community, it exists everywhere. It's a global, it's a global phenomenon. And actually talking about talking about solutions, 
that, what does that, I mean, because, and you say that we shouldn't talk about racism, but the basis of it is racism and colonialism. So it's that mentality, it's that mentality. Why, why would, why is it that some, some black men, and this is some of the work that I was trying to reference um, from, um, from Dr. Um, Aisha Phoenix. So she's just done a recent study because there's not much clinical, there's not many clinical trials in the UK on colorism, but she's done some research recently on colorism um, perceptions within U in the UK for black men. So she looked at, so she asked, so she did a lot of um, qualitative information. So it took the form of uh, interviews. Um, it's just been published where she asked a group of black men who were black and some who were of mixed heritage of their experiences and their thoughts on colorism. And the majority of the black men that were interviewed talked about how they recognized and they acknowledged that, for example, in the job market, if you were lighter on the color spectrum of black, you were more likely to get the, you'd be you'd more likely to get on that sort of like promotion talent pipeline. But not just that, not just with the acquisition of your job, also in your love choices. So a lot of black men look at lighter skinned women, even though their preference may be darker skinned women, they look at, they almost, they do what, what that psychology professor did to the dark skinned women. They kind of fetishize and it's almost like it's like a status symbol to have a to have a lighter skinned woman on your arm as if that's something to acquire so what do we as a community do to counteract that i'd be interested to hear your thoughts and and, and i think yes it's it's yes we do need to look, look at solutions i think we do also need to have the discussions to increase awareness to the extent of the problem um, as as you mentioned, Evelyn, in the I, I, the I agree the US is so much far ad, in, in advanced than the UK when it comes to addressing this. Over here in the UK, a lot of people they 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 know that they may be treated differently, but they're not aware of how deep rooted this goes. So I think we need to be increasing people's awareness about the issues and also looking at what the solutions are. And I think it's about people educating themselves us educating each other, the way that we raise our children, the way that we speak to our children, and, and about us challenging where we do see it happen. And one of the things that I see, which sort of, you know, particularly someone who coaches women, and I, you know, I coach a lot of um, black women, is the impact that it has had on them. And some of them are not even necessarily aware that it is stemmed in racism, the impact that it has on their self-belief, their self-worth, and so I think it's about educating ourselves, educating each other and increasing awareness of these issues so that people feel confident to step up and to challenge. Yeah, and I think you're right, Nadia. I think moving on to solutions would be really good. But I think just to echo what Carol said, one of the reasons I think it's important that we explore this is that these events attract a lot of white people. So a lot of white people are, will either be joining us today or are catching up on recordings um, and on the podcast, and they won't have heard these terms before. So it's really important that we that we express what it is and how that how it presents itself, rather than just moving on. But you're absolutely right. I've been in plenty of groups where all they ever do is talk about the problems and don't talk about about some of the solutions. And there's some really interesting things coming coming up in the chat. Now, one, one that, that has been suggested is that we just remove ourselves completely. Let's just remove ourselves from the West. Let's let's go back home or whatever. That's not their turn to their line. Um, and, and I have an issue with that. So I have an issue with it for two reasons. One, I am, my mother's white. So actually, where is my home? Where do I go back to? Because I've got two homes. And also, I am British. And for all that this country drives me insane at times, um, it's my home. It's my home country. So removing myself from it and from 
the people and the things that I love. You know, I, I work with and for the NHS. I think it's an amazing institution. I'm not going to re remove myself from it. So yes, but is it more complex? Because actually, what does that actually mean? Remove ourselves from it. And I've tried to remove myself from the self from the debate, and I'm not the type of person that does that. Hence this. And so you know, it's how how do we do that? And um, so I, I I personally don't feel that that's a solution. But I would always, if somebody feels that's the solution for them, all power to them. Nancy, I've just spotted you popped your hands up, and I, I saw that Alimatu. I'll come to you. I'll come to Alimatu first, and then back to Nancy if that's okay. okay um. Thank you so much. Uh, and I was actually talking to someone else, but I will say, um, yes, I love that we're discussing it. So please understand, I didn't mean, you know, that, right? Um, I think when I started talking about moving towards solution, it's just, um, I, I, I want to see like a, a sense of maybe hope uh, or, or, or something. And I agree with you, actually. I mean, my fiance is white, British. So this is not about saying everyone needs to be separate. I mean, we're in, it's pride month now. I'm an ally to the gay movement. I'm an ally to, everyone needs to be an ally to everyone. But I, but I feel like that's the end kind of result of what happens once you go through the stages of being aware, right? And then also self-love that journey for yourself. And then once you really love yourself as a black person, you can do all of that and love everyone else. Um, but I don't think it's about everyone needs to be separated, but I do think that we need to start telling, start telling youth. And I think that's what I was more hint when I was hinting towards some solution. Part of what I always feel is a great solution and a way, way to start is telling the truth about how we feel about ourselves and our own internal battles with our, our feeling about being black, the huge- Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but Nandi, yeah. but Nandi it, it all stems from education. It's education of who do you get the education from? You receive it from your parents. I've never experienced, I don't think I've ex experienced colorism within my community. I love my black skin. I love it when I go, to, I love it. I don't put, I don't even put sunscreen on. If I get darker, I love it. So, you know, my husband, my husband is black chocolate, dark chocolate, beautiful, um, gorgeous, lovely man. And, um, and so I think that, I think that what happens, that the damage that colorism perpetuates is usually in the child, in the community that they're within, within their family sometimes. And that's, that stems from education of the, of, of the parents and the wider community, you know? So even though there was that pain, you know, in the sixties, black is beautiful, you know, all this black beauty. Okay, now you're getting there. Right. <laughs> 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 Sorry, could I just have it because yeah. you touched on it quickly, I won't be long. I just needed to say we need to get back where the term blackness started. I, I don't know how to get up there. How, we, how the term blackness started, but the black power movement in the United States and here in, in the United and Kingdom we were experiencing the same racism. So the term black power was used to turn the negativeness of blackness on its head and accepted as a term, but it was not to do anything with the color of our skin. It was to do with the African heritage. That was what blackness is about. And all of a sudden it's about colorism and who want to be light skinned, the mixed race people. Up to recently there was, um, I think she's a singer. She was on a, a TV program and she wanted, she, she couldn't, she was not black, she says. Uh, of course she was thinking of this, the skin color. And um, she wanted a separate race for mixed race people because they were different and, and she didn't, and she was totally negative. And this was being on primetime TV. And, um, you know, I can't remember her name because I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't belong to that era. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just say that we need to separate that out. And yes, we had all these things of colorism, you all touched on that, the slavery and all that that went with it, the conditioning of the, you know, the house slave and how all that came down through history. But we have to get back to where it really started and let them know that black is about all oh, Africanness. It just has no sunny. I laugh at people um, uh, at times and let them know, hold on, we have more than 50 shades of black in all mm -hmm. Africanness. So 100%. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, black in you know, itself <laughs> is, is a, has become politicized. 
Yes. Um, and so back when you had the Black Power movement here in the UK, um, Asian people sort of came under that term Black. And then, then they, the Asians sort of collectively decided, well, they wanted a separate term. That's because it used to be used, the term BME used to be used, Black, Minority, Ethnic. But course, then because the Asians wanted that recognition, it became BAME, B-A-M-E. Mm -hmm. But the term Black is very politicised. And some people are even saying that, well, we shouldn't even use that term Black. We should use African heritage. Yes, yes. Asians, Asians use Asian heritage. We should use African heritage. Very yeah. good point, Carol. And, and it's interesting, actually, because the only time I refer to myself as light skinned black <laughs> yeah. is, is when I'm talking about my privilege <laughs> or about colorism. Because right. as far as I'm concerned, I'm black. But I think sometimes it's important that I point out the privilege that I have because of my skin color. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's real. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much. I and really do want to bring in Animata because she has sat there with her hand up for ages, really patiently. So I hope I'm pronouncing your name right as well. Yes. Do you want me to put my camera on? I see you can do. Yeah, it's entirely up to you. Oh, OK. Um, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Animatu. It's uh, mm -hmm. Hi. I think what I'd wanted to say, everyone seems to have touched up on it, but for me, I think I look at racism from a Christian perspective. Um, I remembered um, when the George Floyd issue um, and murder happened, it was a very painful time for me having to speak to my eight year old son and about people might not like you because the way you because of the color of your skin and I remember a very powerful moment when I was walking because I had to take him to the park and we walk down the street on the road where we live and I said look at the colors and the doors can you see a white door a black door I said from now on we are not black or white we're going to find descriptive ways in which to describe people. We, we are more so than that. And um, if we look at our ethnicity, if we look at where we come from, um, I was born in Sierra Leone, but I grew up in Hackney. So I told him a lot about me, where my family came from, my roots in Mali, my roots in Guinea, my roots in Sierra Leone, and his dad's roots in Nigeria, Edo, um, 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 just the tribe I came from, and, and told him a lot more. And you also born here, you're English. And to, to make them feel like they belong I deliberately make my children participate in, in events where I don't normally see people that look like me. I want them to know this is their home. This is where they grew up because for a while I never felt like that in the 1990s. I think it took a while for me to call myself British. You know, it took a while for me to accept that I'm British. So when I do fill in the form where it says black, African, I don't do that. I put other and I'd explain and I write down all my, all my cultural heritage of what I believe I am. I think just defining me singular, and when I looked up under the, the meaning of the word black, it means um, absent. I'm not absent, I'm present. So I don't want my children to ever feel that they're absent. We're much more than just black and white. We're actually human beings. There's only one race. And, and for as a Christian, I remember it's only Jews and Arabs that are mentioned in the Bible. There are many different tribes also mentioned. Nowhere in the Bible does it say black or white. So that's how I look at racism from a Christian perspective. And I go back to Genesis where God says we're all created in the image of God. So whether we're all different shades is because God likes colours. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That's my and I think I think that point on race is really interesting because, yeah, we are. There is there is no. And, and race is a social construct. And I think it's important that we remember that I talk about ethnicities differently. Um, and because I could use the term cultures, because actually that's what we're talking about. And I think that, um, you know, talking about about African rather than black is probably a really interesting topic to discuss. We don't have time to do it here, but that might be something that we discuss in future. Um, because actually Africa in itself is so diverse. It, it's, you know, that, that's what one of my little hobby horses is that people will talk about Africa as if it's a homo hom homogenous group and it's just not. Yeah, they talk yeah. about Africa as if it's one country. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they say, they say, I'm going to Africa. And I'm like, which country are you going to in Africa? Please, may I ask? It's a bit like the BAME thing, which, oh gosh, that's yeah. not, mm -hmm. not even go there. So, so going back to solutions, I think that, you know, the point that was made about actually this is, and, and racism, and I've said this before, racism is not, is not a black issue, as, as you said, Nandi, it's not a black person's issue. We have to deal with it, but it's not our creating. 
And therefore, if we if if we could solve it, it would have been solved a long, long time ago. It needs others to to be alongside us. And even you were talking about anti-racism, and we keep coming back to this this subject of anti-racism in, in in these events. So what what is it? We've got a couple of minutes left. What is it that we would be asking people to do now that they're aware of anti-blackness? Now that we're, we're aware of colorism, what is it that we're asking people to do, regardless of their ethnicity, that actually could make a difference? And I, I think I think it's about within your sphere of influence, you being somebody that stands up to make a difference, to make a change, no matter how big or how small it is, it could be that you, you call it out when you see it. it, could be that you influence policy change, it could be that you lobby the government or, or politicians to make change, so every single person can do their part, no matter how big or how small it is, um, and I think that's what I would like to leave each and every one of you today, is to think about what can I do if you are somebody who is is white or some other um, from some other ethnic group? Think about how you can be an ally to the um, to black people or people of African heritage in terms of what you can do to address this. But you, when you see when you see racism or you see um, colorism occurring, call it out, challenge it, um, and I think that is for everybody to play their part is what is going to bring about change. Yeah. Um, Yvonne Coghill, um, who was the former director for the Workforce Race Equality Standard for the NHS, um, has an infographic called the eight A's of allyship. Because, I mean, to be an ally is actually quite um, a self, uh, it's quite an absorbing thing. And I think that people, if they're going to be an ally, it's not, it's not something that people can dip in and dip out of. I think if you're going to be an ally, this is a commitment. Um, I did a presentation when I was the, I was, um, the chair for uh, a session called Racism in the NHS at the World College of Ophthalmology Congress in Glasgow um, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the participants in the audience said, well, Evie, um, I'll be an ally, you know, you just have to ask. It's not, it's not for us to ask people to be allies. Allies, if you want to be an ally, that is something that you should offer, understanding exactly what allyship actually is, because it is a huge commitment. It's not, it's not something that people can, you know, oh, one day I'm an ally and one, one day, one day I'm not, you know, because once you once you put yourself forward as an ally you are in the same camp as people who are marginalized and racially discriminated against and you have to do that work and you have to decide do i have the appetite to do that do i do i have the 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 um courage you know it's it's a it's a really deeply committed thing to be to, to be an ally but i agree if you see racism being happening, I, you have to call it out. Don't laugh at that racist joke, you know, because you feel embarrassed. Don't, don't you know, corroborate the perpetrator who, who is actually being racist. Call it out. And I decide that, I mean, I call it out all the time. I, John Amechi, my favorite person on the planet, to describe white privilege. I mean, people ask me about white privilege. I don't even bother explaining it. I just send them the bite-sized link to John Amechi and get him to explain it because he does it in such a beautiful way. He said that even the smallest incivility should be challenged. And he talks about uh, challenging, what does he say? He describes it as um, almost like doing it, not sensitively, but you know, with respect, not kind of like respect, that's not exactly his words, but even if it's the smallest instability, one should actually challenge it. You should yeah. get it out. And if you can be bothered, because sometimes I cannot be bothered, you should call it in and actually explain, but that's only if I can be bothered. Yeah, yeah. And and actually we, um, and Gozi shared that video in the last event, which you can, can catch up on the recording of that. 
Um, because there's a whole load more discussion, I think that's that's really valuable in that. And I think I, I would kind of add to, to what both of you have said is one of the things I'd ask people to do is to not question when somebody says that they are experiencing racism and prejudice. When somebody says something is anti-black or that anti-blackness or colorism exists, don't don't ask for reams and reams and reams of evidence. Don't 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 discount what they're saying. Listen, accept. If you feel uncomfortable, fine, but let it sit. Sit with that discomfort and just think, what, what's that saying and what do I need to do about it? So yes, call it out. But actually, if it's not something you've experienced, you might miss it. But if somebody then knows that you're an ally and you've missed it and they say, you saw this and you didn't challenge it, don't say that's not racist. Just say, sorry, I'll do better next time. Nobody's perfect. I agree, Steph, I agree with that 100% because to challenge is a form of gaslighting. Yeah, yeah? it's a <clears throat> gaslighting. And it's interesting, you know, Steph, because I had this conversation as well a couple of weeks ago, because if you're talking about sexism, misogyny, everybody finds it so much easier to talk about and to be an ally, you know, and they accept it, all right? But when it comes to racism, there's always all oh, that what about you? Oh, well, what about this? And what about that? Yeah, well, what about this, you know? So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Accept it. Well, I, I suspect we could talk about this for hours. Um, and um, I just hope that there are people, plenty of people are going to pick up on this and listen to it and the people who can really make the difference and we've kind of indicated who they might be. Um, thank you so much for, for your time. I've had a really active chat, which I will share um, after after this, this event closes as well. Um, thank you everybody for your participation um, and for your attention. Just to say um, that if you're watching it on YouTube or podcasts, like and subscribe, because it means you get to see the stuff, but also that others will be alerted to our content as well. Um, and we do have an event coming up on the 14th of July, which is a youth perspective on inclusion, and we'll bring in even more elements that we haven't yet addressed. So thank you both for your time and for the effort that you put into this. And thank you everybody for um, attending and hope to see you soon. Thank you, and I look forward to Thank you, and thank you everyone for attending and for being so engaged. Yeah, thank you so much everybody, have a fabulous day.